In this week's video, I'm celebrating hitting a thousand subscribers by taking a look through some of the first photographic art that I ever produced to see just why I was so terrible. Uh, I'll also be answering a lot of your questions that you've been sending in, so plenty of stuff coming up. So I have hit a thousand subscribers. It's uh, relatively a very small milestone, of course, in terms of how much uh, a lot of other YouTube channels have, but it's really, really meaningful for me. Um, I only ever started this channel as basically just a little bit of fun. Um, I didn't expect to get anything like this number of subscribers, certainly not so soon anyway. Um, and yeah, I'm extremely grateful. Uh, everyone has been so friendly, so welcoming, some really great uh, feedback on the videos that I've done. Um, and I love talking to people about how they're how they're taking their own shots and how some people have found some some great tips from what I've uh, what I've put out and then showing me the results. It's it's honestly been absolutely amazing. So I did want to make uh, this video a little bit different. Um, obviously, unfortunately, we are still in lockdown. I'm not going anywhere. So um, my original plan to go somewhere particularly special for a thousand subscribers and do a really cool shoot has sort of gone out the window. But I think this is going to work better because it's it's about well, the Q&A part certainly is certainly bringing you all as an audience in um, and making you all part of the video, which is uh, fitting, I think. Nice and fitting. Um, but I did want to start off by going through some of my old photos because I found an old backup drive and I found my whole collection of old photos. And this is stuff that I took... Um, just for fun and this is stuff that I also took as part of I think my GCSE art um, which I insisted on doing um, as photography rather than drawing because I, I can't draw it's not my thing um, and uh, I found some absolute corkers in there some real real stinkers um, which I think has been really interesting um, and I've thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed going through and having a look and seeing how I've how I've developed and, and how I've got rid of some of my really rather shady uh, Photoshop usage back in the day. So um, I've got them all on screen. That's what I'm looking at. And uh, I thought, let's just dive straight in. And we're going to start with this church. And as you can see, hoo boy, I have got some explaining to do with this one. Um, this was a very, very early bit of Photoshop experimentation. We've obviously got this uh, brown and uh, black and brown sort of effect on the church itself, but crucially in the sky. Now, I think I've done several things here. I have, first of all, as you can see, I've, I've found some script, some sort of text from God knows what which I've overlaid onto the sky, presumably in some way thinking it's weirdly biblical or something to go with the church. I honestly don't know what I was thinking. Uh, it looks terrible, and um, obviously we've got script going one way, and then we've got another one coming up a diagonal, um, so it's very, very, very messy. But it also looks like I've got these weird swirly lines going on, and... I can only assume that I've made those somehow. I don't remember doing this. Um, it says it was from 2002. I'm not entirely sure that's right. I think it might have been a little bit later, but I think I pulled this from something and maybe didn't save the exit data. Um, those swirly lines look terrible. And then also I think I have created the clouds and the cloud colours by using the filter difference clouds and then added some color in there and it just it's just awful it's it's far too much and I seem to remember being weirdly proud of this at the time um of I, I, and maybe I don't know I, I don't wrong I don't think this this shot ever looked good no one professionally would ever look at this and go oh yeah this is interesting but at some you know, when I was maybe I don't know, 14 or however old I was, and no one else was really using Photoshop. I don't think anyone else even had Photoshop. Um, uh, f very few people even had their own digital cameras. Doing something like this stood out because no one else even had the tools available to do this kind of thing. So even though it is unquestionably painfully terrible, it was at least 
different at the time. Um, I suppose maybe I'm trying to think of excuses of why I'm not absolutely terrible um we'll move on and i'm going to skip to this picture of a flower now this is definitely one of the first pictures i ever remember taking from a, a genuinely artistic perspective where i knew the shot i wanted to get and i took it i took this on my first digital camera it was a fujifilm fine fujifilm fine pix a202 it was this tiny little two megapixel uh point and shoot tiny little screen on the back um, and it was very expensive at the time I think it was about 200 pounds I mean very expensive for uh, I would have been maybe 13 I think maybe 14 um, at this point when I when I got this uh, this camera and um, but I took this in a uh, in a like a conservatory a, a public conservatory with with loads of flowers in and because it was the way that the light was going on this, I have done some Photoshop work clearly to this, but there was actually very little in the background. I remember the flower did sort of naturally stand out from its background. Um, I did some work on this one to bring it out, but then I went and doubled down on that work in this shot, which I called Flower to the Power of Ten. No idea why. And this was on, I put this on DeviantArt, if you remember DeviantArt. And uh, this was for a long time my most liked flower. And in my defense, whatever I've done to sort of boost the textures, like you see all these, like the veins and, and stuff in the in the flower petals, which um, I do think looks kind of cool. Um, obviously, the colors are all awful and it's it, it's bad. I, I, what I would really like to be able to do is have the exact same shot taken on a good camera now, do the exact same steps in Photoshop and see what this looks like. Obviously, I can't. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I think interesting if we just go and have a look back at the the not quite original, the less produced one. I just think it's, an, it's a nice enough shot. It could be a studio lit thing. And for something that's taken just with minimal processing and, and certainly almost no photographic knowledge straight out of a tiny little uh, point and shoot, I don't think it's... I don't think it's too terrible. Um, it was certainly one of the ones I was I was particularly proud of when I when I first started. Um, moving on to uh, minimal rock, this shot is called. Um, I'm not going to be too I'm not going to be too harsh about this shot because I remember going. I think this is up near um, one of the climbing edges uh, in uh, in the Peak District, maybe around Stanage or something, and. Um, this rock stood out to me. As you can see, we've got lovely autum autumnal colours. There's good texture in the sky, which I haven't really used to good effect here. Um, but this rock just stood out to me because it was just by itself, and it 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 stood out from the heather that we've we've got there, and it stood out against the background. Crucially, I've made the horizon go below the tip of the rock, so at least compositionally, I've done something right. Uh, I don't love the processing, and I think a lot of this. The, the issues of the processing, uh, there's blown out bits in the clouds and there's a lot of noise and, and just artifacts problem in the in the picture. I think that's largely just down to the fact that I was using such a basic camera. Um, and this was back in the day when I put my own borders on all of my photos, which was a, a, a mistake. But you know, I don't think this is I don't think this is terrible. I don't I don't hate this shot. Um, I remember it was one of the first um, among the first landscape shots that I ever really kind of got into, uh, and I and I quite liked that. And I think I learned quite a bit from that. I did a black and white version, which is awful. Um, and on the same trip, I found these rocks, which I just called bum rocks because well, they looked a bit like a bottom, maybe. That was childish. Um, I think this this one I've done here is completely straight out of camera. There's no processing, and I suppose you could argue that I've. The lines in the rocks are almost a bit of a leading line taking you through into the scene, but then I'd argue that the horizon is off and colours and are terrible and it's um yeah, it, it needs a lot of work. It it is what it is. Um I don't have loads to say about that. So I'm gonna move on and we're going to go to this shot of a wall. Now I seem to remember that this was a, a an early attempt at HDR. Um, processing on this one. I wish I had the original because I think I have done two things. One, I think I have replaced the sky as part of that HDR merge. I, I think I took the sky, uh, a darker sky, um, but because this was a long time before any kind of auto HDR um, tools or before HDR was even really known, we didn't even have things like 
the Photomatics plugins and anything like that. This was years before that. So I think I have literally just cut out the sky. And if we zoom in, we can see that it is quite a crude cutout. You can very much see that joining line, um, which isn't great. But the other thing I've done is uh, I have photoshopped out a uh, an extra line of um, uh, barbed wire on the left hand side. I think basically if you follow the line of where those uh, yellow flowers are, um, that was where there was a, a big, more distracting patch of, um, of fence that, uh, that I didn't want in the shot. And I actually think I've done a pretty neat job um, of doing that at least. Um, overall, it's not a great shot. Yes, there's sort of a leading line in the wall itself, but it's not leading anywhere. It's not taking you into the scene. And even though I tried replacing the sky, I've not replaced it with a good sky. Yeah, there's some nice sunset colours, but it's really blown out in the middle. Um, and the wall itself isn't even centered so if we're supposed to be looking down it I could have at least done a better job in moving the camera so we are looking straight down it which would have made it a little bit more visually pleasing but I can see that I was at least thinking uh, at that point so uh, we'll move on this was taken up at Solomon's Temple in Buxton which I've done more recently in a, in a, in a video and this is another one I did there then I don't hate this shot either, um, because at least compositionally, I've evidently been thinking more about what it is that I want to do. So I've got this sign in the foreground, which I think actually, looking at it, that looks a little bit photoshopped. It looks like you've you've pasted that sign in over the top. I actually haven't. That is that was there. Um, so I like that. That kind of it almost tells a story of of the sign of you know it's pointing up towards the temple. I think that's. Um, I don't think that's too bad um, at all. The The issue I have is just with the processing and that it's, it's very obvious that I've tried to really pull back every bit of highlight detail. I've boosted a lot of shadows as a result. There's a lot of noise. There's haloing around the castle, um, the tower and the sign. Um, the, and which, again, you, you could just argue, well, I think this may have been on my first digital, my first... No, this will have been on the A2. This was long before I got my my first DSLR. So, you know, it was not taken on a on a good camera, two megapixels, and um, just a very standard point and shoot. So, I think to even get a shot like this out of that camera, I don't I don't mind that. Um, I don't mind that at all. Um, what is far less forgivable is what I'm about to do to this shot. So, let's just move on to this one. First of all, I think this is basically the same one, but I've just boosted that contrast and made those colors even more vibrant, uh, which it didn't need, and I've spoiled the shot already, but let's spoil it even more, and let's go to solsvery1.jpg, and good lord, I, I I don't know what this is. I mean, what, so what I think I've, I've got, in fact, let's just skip through. solsvery1, solsvery2, oh dear me, Salisbury 3, okay, and finally, if you're ready for this, this one, um, it's just not very good, but what I think I was doing is not necessarily trying to do shots which I think I really liked, but I, if I remember, it's part of my coursework for GCSE when I was 15, was to uh, sort of do variants on a theme basically so I think what I what I've done was I've got this original shot and then I was showing you know which I'd, I think I'd put together as a collage these four different versions a little bit and I'm not trying to be very grandiose about my own stuff and compare myself to an artistic master but a little bit like an Andy Warhol pop art print the ones where it's for different colors in different things. I think that was kind of what I was trying to go for. Different colours, different styles across the thing. Each one of them more terrible than the last. In particular, Sol's very full with this sort of weird lightning effect in the sky. Um, and which I, I think I created by using difference clouds and then upping the contrast on those difference clouds. Um, 
because and we didn't have like lightning brushes at the time um so i don't think i don't think i was trying to make it look like lightning because obviously it's not coming down and, and hitting i think i just wanted that interesting pattern in the sky but yeah so if i remember i'm not trying to find excuses for myself but also i very much am trying to find excuses for myself i don't think i was trying to make these look like good pictures i think i was just trying to make them intentionally weird and funky in order to kind of basically tick the boxes on my coursework. Is anyone buying this? I don't know. Okay, let's move on to something else. And this is a shot of a ladybird, obviously. One of my first attempts at doing macro, and it's fine as a first attempt at macro. It's, it's I've obviously managed to get close up. Uh, I have apparently got so close that it isn't even properly in focus. Um, I don't know what I took this on. Um, in all honesty, I don't have tons to say about this shot. It is what it is. It's just a picture of a ladybird taken on an old camera that can't really do macro properly. Um, you know, compositionally, it's just null. Uh, there's nothing. I haven't really thought about how to present it. It's just in the middle of the frame. We've got this sort of stick off to the left. Um, and it looks like the ladybird itself is standing on this just big bit of mud. Um, and... Yeah, I think I've over-processed over it as well. There's a lot of image noise on the Ladybird itself, so I've clearly tried to bring back a lot of exposure. I'm shooting ISO 400, f2.8, um, a thousandth of a second, so I at least had it uh, fast enough shutter speed to stop, to stop motion blur. But let's move on to a couple of other um, early macro attempts. We've got a butterfly. Um, which actually was going back to what I was talking about in one of my in my last video about macro tips in that this is fine, you know, it's close up on the butterfly and, and maybe I've even got that bit of thistle in there. So compositionally, it's not terrible, um, but we're not a very good angle for the butterfly itself. Um, what I would say is that I did talk about before getting down an eye level with the insect and really showing it off. Now, I think actually, if you've got down at eye level of this, you'd lose a lot of that color on the wings when it's sitting there. It's got its wings open. You see all that amazing color and detail on it. So actually, I think I'd have liked to have tried to move around at about the level I was in order to keep that color in, but just find a much better way of showing it off. Um, I think this is just an example of what I did was just a snap in that I saw the butterfly and I stood there and went, snap, got it. Didn't really think about moving around, how to, to do things. I think the fact that I didn't cut off this big uh, thistle is, is luck rather than anything um so i i don't think i really thought it through in that sense similarly this this one of a b um i have evidently tried to get a little bit lower um but we're still not seeing it from a from a great angle if i'd have moved around i could have maybe seen a bit more of its of its face i could have maybe seen uh seen it actually trying to feed on that pollen um instead we're not really getting that um, and again it's it's a very very noisy image and but again we'll put that down to it just being from a very old camera um a couple of other macro um things which we've got i'm just having a look through the collection that i've um i've created here um this one of uh, a little water drop on a on a leaf on a bit of clover um yeah actually don't hate it uh, it could be a lot better if I had a better camera to use, but I didn't. I was on um, uh, an old point and shoot again. Um, so I've tried to get as close as I can. I've, I've evidently noticed that it's sort of catching the light and it's got this nice specular highlight on, which is making it stand out. Um, and I think I was just out on a walk somewhere in the Peak District when I, when I, when I saw it, obviously during or after a bit of rain. So, you know, it's, it's, it's fine, but compositionally, again, it's terrible there's no there is no composition here the the clover it's sort of just lingering in the bottom thirds of the screen it's not it's not center but it's not positioned intentionally anywhere um i mean sure yeah i could just sort of crop in and, and fix that a little bit in in post but let's not bother um it's uh yeah it's it it, it could have been a lot better and if i'd have learned more at the time about photography and this was uh, not it was certainly not pre-internet but it was pre a lot of you know you know today you can go on internet on the internet and just find 
so many resources for how to improve your photography. YouTube, of course, and there are so many other websites dedicated to to telling you how to, to take better and better shots. And at the time, I didn't really have that. I didn't have great access to the internet anyway. Um, so I was buying things like Digital Camera Magazine every maybe two or three months when I could afford it. Um, and so sometimes I got a good tip, but sometimes they'd talk about traveling. And I was 14, I wasn't traveling. Or they'd talk about wildlife photography, which I did like, but I couldn't afford the equipment. So um, I am trying to find excuses for myself. And I don't need to, because some of these are just purely, purely terrible. Um, while we're on uh, the close-ups on plants and things... Let's go to Snow Rose Black and White, as I called it. Now, this is such a deviant art emo picture from when I was an emo kid. Obviously, we've got the what photographers now will see as the cardinal sin of selective colour when I left in that red. And it was a proper emo boy's um, little dream picture. Um, and it's this, I think I called it on deviant art, Forgotten Rose because we've got this rose has been left out in the snow and nobody picked it to give to their sweetheart and now it's all lonely and by itself and I use a selective colour to show it's still shining bright in this dark colourless world. Boo-hoo. Yeah, it's um it's cliche. It's um it's it's weird, but you know, I'm I'm at least thinking about trying different things and I, I am in no way saying that I was doing this before Selective colour was that much of a cliche. I am sure it was. Um, but it wasn't quite the... You look at it now and go, oh my god, what have you done? Absolutely not. No, get rid of it. Stop stop that. Um, so maybe slightly forgivable. Um, and But again, I, can, I was at least thinking. I can see the thought process that I had in order to want to kind of get there. And I kind of had a vision of what I wanted that shot to be and went through those steps to uh, to get there. So, you know, not terrible, and the composition isn't terrible. We've got the out-of-focus background, so the rose actually stands out. The exposure is decent. Um, overall, I, I think it could be a lot worse. Speaking of a lot worse, let's go and see some other things which are a lot worse. Uh, Mimic, I think I called this shot. This is, again, was part of my coursework in trying to find experimental ways of, of doing interesting edits. Um, and so I had my friend Joe do some handstands, and then I tried to do a composite um, and put them into the shot. I think in this one... You know what? They may all be... I think, I think all three of these ones are... I have put in, or maybe the middle one. You know, I'm not sure. I've not done a terrible job in that sense, I suppose, if I can't tell. They all look bad. Um, yeah, so I've just tried to put different versions of his handstand in. I've, I, I remember creating the shadows by uh, copying him, flipping him around, uh, removing the colour, adding a Gaussian blur, and then dropping the opacity uh, in order to create it. Um, so they don't look, they're not realistic looking shadows, um, and I haven't feather them out, doesn't know how to. In a similar theme, we did this one, Joe 5, when he's on the trampoline. Uh, I think the original one I used for this was the one of him in the middle with his arms and legs out. Uh, the one on the in the trampoline, I remember photoshopping in, spent ages trying to get the curve, the uh, sort of where he's standing on the trampoline to, to match up properly. Um, I think I've done an okay job, and considering I was doing this with just the uh, the lasso tool going round, um, drawing around it, and a little bit the uh, the magic wand brush. But this was back in um, two thousand and five, I think, fifteen years ago. So you can imagine how much work Adobe has done on improving the quality of the magic wand tool since then. So I think to have got even this extent, cutting them out of quite complex backgrounds with all those trees and stuff. Um, I don't think that's too bad. Um, conceptually, it's not great. What I was, if I remember what I was going for, is those amazing shots that you see in like snowboarding magazines um, that like the Red Bull photographers do when you it you see, say, a, a, a snow jump and it's like a wide scene and you see the same snowboarder 30 times 
going all the way along at different stages of their trick and it's been composited into one photo so you can follow what they're doing. I wasn't trying to necessarily do exactly that, but I remember that being the sort of thing that I was thinking about doing and wanting to put the different moves that he's done on the trampoline into the one shot to kind of show that in action. For a, what would I be, 2005, 15 years ago, I'd have been 17, that ages me. Um, I don't think that's it. I don't think that's terrible. This one is terrible. Joe 3 Color Play, I've called it. And again, an uh, experimental edit for my coursework. Um, it's weird. I don't know what I was doing. I don't like how distorted it all is. And the, it, oh, it's just very, very bizarre. So, um, uh, no, don't like that one. I would happily just get rid of that all together and pretend I never took it. Um, let's move over to some older shots again. A couple I've got around bucks and some black and white ones. We'll start with Alley Lights. Um, this one, I just remember going out when we'd had some nice snow in Buxton. And um, yeah, it was just a nice scene looking down an alleyway with the old fashioned, uh, the Victorian uh, street lights that they've, that they've still got. Um, just a bit of a, a bit of a nothingy shot. It's just looking down at the pathway. I haven't evidently really thought too much um, about how I'm positioning myself. I could have maybe got a bit lower to the ground. Um, it's also just not that great a shot. Um, and obviously, I've I haven't done any kind of work to try and uh, recover some of those highlights in the um, in the street light itself. I could have maybe taken another shot and tried blend that, but I had no idea at the time how to do that sort of thing. Um, uh, we've obviously lost loads of detail in the actual dark sky as well, so the rest of the image basically falls to black. But, you know, that's fine. On the same shoot, I did this one, Bridge 2, and it's awful. Um, yeah, the composition's really bad. Um, it's just a picture of the bridge at night. Um, it's It was blurry when I took it. I don't know if... Yeah, 0 0.8 seconds, so almost a second. Handheld, no image stabilisation. Um, yeah, so the shot is blurry. And then I've added on some sort of filter that almost looks like it's one of those... Um, you know, like a sketch effect, basically, like a pastel um, or a charcoal drawing effect over the top, which um, I don't think it needs and just makes it a very weird-looking shot overall. Yeah, we'll cast this one straight into the bin. Um, just going to move my hat around. I'm wearing a hat, of course. I haven't explained. But my hair's looking really terrible. I, it hasn't been cut since January, and I'm interested to see how it grows out. I'm doing the same with the beard, obviously, but right now I'm in that stage where it just looks really bad so i'm leaving it as it is okay let's move on and find some other shots to laugh at um while we're on black and white let's go to some landscapes and um this one i this this little series i did i went up to um i can't remember a, a, a lovely scene that's overlooking the peak district i was trying to mimic two photographers and initially I was in, I was really into the idea of black and white landscapes looking at Ansel Adams work of course the globally famous um, photographer of American landscapes uh, always using black and white amazing amazing work I mean I was also wanting to uh, sort of get some inspiration from a local photographer called Dave Butcher who also did these black and white landscapes um, around the Peak District um, I actually contacted him at the time and, and told him I was doing this. He sent me some prints that I could use to put in that. So, um, yeah, it was really nice. So I, I found, yeah, he was definitely an inspiration in, in, in some of my early landscape stuff. But which brings me on to this shot. And um, it's not great. It's really not at all. But, but compositionally, there's, there's a lot wrong with this. We've got that rock that's been very much cut off at the bottom, bottom of the frame. That line of rocks in the middle doesn't really do anything, it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't really have a point, and of course we've got this big empty sky with basically no cloud detail in, and the problem is is that when I'm only 15, 16 or so, um, you don't have the luxury of being able to stay out there all day and overnight for get sunrises and stuff. I think um, my mum had dropped me off, I was waiting in the cafe near nearby, I'd then gone and done this hike to get my shots and that was it. So. Um, 
as an adult with a car, I'd be able to go out at whatever time, go out for sunrise and get some great light, get some great clouds or whatever, or go out again and again and again, but I couldn't do that. Uh, so there we go. Let's move on to another one. This one, a little bit better. We haven't got big rocks being cut off in the bottom of the frame, and you could argue, I suppose, that it sort of fits the rule of thirds and that the top of that line is sort of in the top thirds. It drops off in the right thirds. Um, there's a little bit more cloud interest going on, but it's a little bit nothing as a shot. It's not very interesting. Um, this one, the Walker shot, slightly better. Um, we have got an empty sky and we've got that line of plane going across it. But um, we've at least got the pathway that's sort of leading the eye into the distance over the hill. And we've got the Walker on there, which um, is giving... So you know what? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. I photoshopped in that walker. That's what I've done. Um, it looks a little big. I might be wrong, but yeah, that I um, I've definitely photoshopped them in. And if you really zoom in, you can. It, I've I've done a terrible job of photoshopping that walker in. Uh, absolutely terrible. But um, there we go. At least it's it, I, I've understood the concept of putting a person in a frame to give size context to a scene. Um, so those are my, oh, I've got one more actually in that scene, Scape 2, and this was my favourite one, and it's still one that I don't, um, it's not brilliant, but I've really thought more about it. Um, first of all, compositionally, we've got these rocks in the foreground, uh, and, and the eye does sort of therefore move through the scene a little bit more. Um, it was evidently a day with not loads of clouds, but we've at least got some going on there. And I do like the way we've got that layer, um, the layered effect of the landscape as it kind of moves away, gets a little bit more hazy as it gets further away from the camera. So this one was my favourite of the ones that I took that day. And um, yeah, I think I think even now looking at it, it's the strong, it's not great. Um, but it's the, it's certainly the strongest um, of the bunch. Um, while we're on landscapes, let's go to some earlier ones I did in um, Ireland. We'll start with this one of this uh, of this lighthouse. I think this was on the Isle of Arran, the Arran Islands. It's the one that's got the abandoned boat, which I also have some shots of somewhere that was in that's in the intro sequence to the Father Ted, uh, one of my favourite shows. Um, this is just a picture of a lighthouse, really. I haven't tried to do anything too much, but we've got an overall decent exposure. Um, zooming in, there's very little detail. There's a lot of noise on there, um, uh, on the actual lighthouse itself, but I was shooting on, again, quite an old camera, um, so I think I was doing the best I could. I think my horizon is basically straight, but it's just a... It's just a straight-on middle composition shot of a lighthouse. Very ho-hum. This one's a little bit better um, because we have at least some compositional elements going on. I've put the lighthouse in the right thirds pretty much. We've got the line of the coast that sort of cuts through the scene for your eye to follow. Um, I'm not sure my horizon is straight just looking at that water, but you know, near enough, and we've got uh, you know some interest going on in the sky. So, overall, you know, this is not this is not terrible. There are many things I would do differently if I was taking this shot now, but I think if I was there now, I would take a variety of shots, and one of them probably wouldn't be too far away from something like this. Uh, whilst I was in Ireland, I did this shot. This was another selective color shot of these boats. Which again is a bit cliche, sort of thing you might see on um, on the wall of a of a tea shop where they're selling some local photographer's prints, but the local photographer isn't very good, but their prints are selling for an unfathomably high price. Um, it's it, it's fine. It's just a picture of some boats. The sky's blown out. Um, yeah, it's pretty boring. Um, on the topic of lakes, we've got Lake JPEG. This is looking at Goit Valley Reservoir in the Peak District, and um, yeah, it's bad. It is super bad. There's nothing going on really compositionally to speak of here. It's The exposure is obviously off, and good Lord knows what I have done with the processing on this, but it is terrible. This yellow colour over the top, it's not quite black and white, 
or black and yellow. I don't know what I've done. It's awful. And then I've again I've I've overlaid this texture on the top, trying to make it look all grungy and weird and absolutely not. This is terrible. Um, speaking of weird overlays, this is another one I did in Ireland, and I'd say this is a slightly compositionally better shot in the sense that the eye sort of slightly follows the river, but even then I think that's wishful thinking. Um, I intentionally did a very over blown image i don't but i don't i no longer know why this these very strong oranges and blues in there it's very very weird but also for some reason at the time i was really into scan lines um having that sort of lined effect that i've that i've applied over the top which i'm creating as a as a, as a texture in photoshop by creating a texture which is uh, one pixel white, one pixel black, and then you just apply it and scale it down so that you get these scan line effects. And I did it on loads of pictures at the time, absolutely loads. Don't think there's anything else um, on those that I put them in here, just quickly flicking through. No, there's not. But yeah, yeah, that was absolutely terrible. Um, let's speed up, move on to some other ones quickly. I'm going to try and go through because I'm aware well, it's probably taking some time. Nature, Robin couple of Robin shots here. Robin 3 um, is my, this one is my favourite. Uh, this is just taken outside my house. It's just a nice shot of a Robin. I remember I used a, uh, a telephoto extension tube to get more out of my lens. Uh, the result was that it's really not very sharp, but I think I took this on my first DSLR, the Canon EOS 350D, 8 megapixels as far as I remember, and um, if there's any detail on this, no, we haven't got any, unfortunately, no EXIF data to show what I was taking, but I think I was at about ISO 1000 in order to get a faster shutter speed to freeze it. So it's a lot of image noise. Uh, moving on to some more weird edits. Has wings, I've called this. We've gone for the emo thing of guy with butterfly wings. Weird. Um, a fire breathing shot. Uh, we used to do quite a lot with Poi. Uh, I was really pleased with this shot because I've captured... Uh, a lot of the the actual tones of the fireball itself, uh, which is quite tricky because you do this at night, and um, obviously if you're shooting at night, you're thinking, okay, let in a lot of light, but then suddenly this big ball of fire, and you've got to use actually a very fast shutter speed to capture that. So um, more of the weird edits, um, the the looking through the hand, um, we've got two, and um, hands, we're looking at hands dune and. In a way, I would argue I was a little ahead of the time in that I see a lot of this stuff on Instagram now of, of people doing this or maybe looking out of the the, uh, the front door of their house and, and seeing a different and seeing that they're photoshopped in. It's kind of like, a, ooh, where your imagination would take you. Um, but I've done a terrible job I, I because... I've evidently just taken a random photo of, of the, these hands just in the middle of the road, but I've not even thought about how... If you were, I it, it I, what was I thinking? If you were on a, why didn't I take it at least on a pathway so you can like the line of the of the path that we're photoshopping in at least follows a line that's already in the scene so there's some cohesion so it's almost like you walk down either path and I haven't done that. Um, we you can see the pavement and a double yellow lines and just cars parked. Um, I put zero thought into where I was taking the original shot. I was only thinking just about, oh, Photoshop something into the middle, and that's it, that'll do. Um, and so same again with the other ones in that series, Hands Beach. Again, we're just seeing for sale boards in the background and, and cars, and it's terrible. Um, so, okay, let, let's, let's move on. Um, we're going to take a look now at bridge two and this is just a bridge shot um somewhere in the peak district it's uh it's nothing it's overblown i've overdone the colors the sky's blown out um it, it's it's very very poor um tree.jpg it's just a tree i thought at first that i'd used flash a light but so then i realized that i didn't have a flash so this is just catching the last light of a day as it's come through so, kind of pleased that I was sort of looking at lighting within like a forest scene in that way, but I've not used it to good effect at all. Um, mushroom shot. This lovely big mushroom, though, is, is quite nice. Um, 
<laughs> it's nice enough colors exposure is decent um but it's you know it's fine it's decent there's nothing there's nothing exciting about it there's it's not an award winning shot but it's not terrible either i've evidently put some thought into how i'm going to put this one together um i did a few nature ones at the time i did these close ups on these old um autumnal leaves which i i quite liked at the time and again is it's just it's inoffensive um but i did i did find these uh these these leaves and i remember really loving this shot at the time because i loved that you've got in this one shot what looks like the same plant but on one side it's green and then it merges into the red so it's like i my thought process was it's like this seasons are merging but in one image you see it going from like summer through to autumnal colors and i, I know that wasn't really what was happening um but you know i quite liked that um i'm going to move on to some of my early scotland images now there's a few that i want to talk about we'll start with just this main badger one now this was just a a badger i found at hyde when i was up in uh, Av in aviemore yes it was in aviemore in scotland um and uh yeah i was able to get a shot of a, a badger it's not my lighting it's his lighting in that the hyde uses to light them up so you can get photos Again, I was taking this on my EOS 350D, so low light was not terrible, and I was using a kit lens, so I think this is probably at, um, yeah, f5.6 ISO 1600 on a camera that does not do well anything above ISO 800. So, yeah, I pushed it a lot. And similarly, this one, Badger 4, when it's in the tree, these are fine. These are, these are snaps of badgers from that hide, I would expect almost anyone with the camera I had to be able to take those same shots. There's no real thought into how I'd to, um, how I'd gone about them. Um, but I'd done some landscapes when we were out there. We'd gone out on a boat, and um, there's a few in this series. We'll start with just boat.jpg. And the thing that really is the strength of these set of images is the sky, because we've got the sky detail, but we've also got those light rays coming down and cutting into the scene, which looks great, and it's captured quite well on this camera, um, despite it being so old and not a very good camera. But compositionally, I think I've let myself down again, because we've got the bow, and yes, I've sort of put it in the bottom right, I've, I've tried to think about using negative space and how to do that. But I think I've got it a little bit too far over that over that way, and um, I think I could do a straightening it up, and it needs some work certainly. But I really like what I was going for with it, and this one is another one. Boats, uh, this this square crop that I've done, I've I've overprocessed it massively. The amount of dodging and burning I've put in and tried to light up that lock inch on the boat is just looks awful. This is a much wider one. Now, this is the one that I was most proud of because of these orange colours, the, the colours of the sunset that we had at the time. Um, I absolutely loved um, and seeing not only the light rays coming down from that middle patch in the sky, but also in the, the sky in the distance. But again, the problem is, is that there's zero composition here at all. It's just a picture of the lake and the sky i haven't there's no thinking about how the 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 boats are lining up i've not tried to move anywhere to get something else i've literally just seen the scene and it's gone Tsh! and i think that's the thing which has changed most about my photography and that i will try and you know i don't just see something in front of me and take a photo anymore i i think how can i capture this what is it that i want to get from this scene sometimes Maybe in the case with this, the light dictates what you can do. Uh, if I'm somewhere just very quickly wanting to get a shot, you know, with the light like this doesn't hang around. This may have only been like that for a matter of a couple of minutes, and in which case you don't have time to go around the lake and find somewhere else. Um, also, I was on holiday with my family in Scotland, and again, I was maybe 17, I think, 18. Uh, so... I probably wasn't able to just wander off and go and get my own stuff. So um, it's, it's at the time I remember being so proud of this and, it, and I am proud of it looking back at what kind of what I was getting, but it's not obviously one that would still be in a portfolio now. Last one in the shot again, same thing, lovely light rays, composition, pretty, pretty ho-hum. Um, I'm going to move just to the last few now. Um, this is a shot of Lincoln Cathedral, which meant that I took this when I was at university. 
And I would love to have said that when I was at university, and this was 2008, so 12 years ago, so I'd have been 21. No, I wouldn't. Yeah, I would. Something like that. Early 20s. That I'd love to have think that I would have been able to take much better photos in my early 20s than I did with this one. Uh, there are some photographers I know now in their early 20s and way younger who are just superb, way above what I'm, what I'm, what I'm doing now. Um, and yeah, this is not impressive. This is, this is what I meant in my last, one of my videos when I talked about the importance of learning, when I said that I am not a naturally talented person. I am not, I do not, I do not have natural abilities to be able to see a scene and know exactly how I want to compose it. And I think I've proved that by looking through these old photos like it's evident that I didn't I was not able to think and about a scene in an amazing way even when I was taking my first photos my first photos provably terrible really really bad the reason why I'm taking better photos now is because I've spent that time in learning how to take better shots I've 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 persevered I've gone out when I can with my camera taking more and more photos it's not been about improving my equipment yes that's had a hand in certainly from the early point and shoot ones and uh, low light quality um, with the badger ones we saw but the thing that's improved is is how I think about my photos and, and my understanding of composition and what makes for a good photo because even here at, at 21 I was not thinking about how to make this a good photo but crucially at 21 I also wasn't trying to be a professional photographer I was um, trying to be a, a psychologist so um this was, uh, yeah, I, I have my excuses again that I wasn't really trying. Um, and latterly, you know, again, this was at uni inside this abandoned building we found. You know, there's some better use of, of light in, in the way that the light's coming and hitting this old, uh, this old bit of building. Um, but compositionally, this one's not too terrible. This one, there's no real composition going on in this scape inside. And... Um, there's just lots of things strewn. I've not thought about foreground interests. I've not thought about patterns and textures and stuff. It's just a picture of the inside of that building. There really is so much more I could have done. Um, which does bring me to the end of um, of my old photos. So yeah, again, I'll reiterate that I think it's clear that I have not been... If I... Let's, let's be boastful and say that now, these days, I'm not too bad at taking photos. Um, I, I would like to even think that I'm quite good. But the only reason that I've got to the point where I am now is by learning everything I can and trying again and failing and criticising my own work and thinking, what have I done wrong in this shot? And then as I've learned, as I've progressed, my shots have steadily improved to the point that today I can go out and I can look at a landscape and I can think about how I want to take it and I can even try and plan and think, okay, well, if I want to take this shot, at this time of day, the light's going to be really harsh. So maybe I could try and get there in the morning or in the evening and the light's going to be different. I didn't know about those things at the time. And as I say before, as a kid, you don't have those controls. But um, I, I, I hope that has been potentially helpful to those of you who, who look at some photographer's work, um, maybe not even, maybe not necessarily mine, but other like big names on Instagram look at their work and think, oh wow, you know, they've probably always been so talented, like I could never get to them. I'm sure they have also got these hidden shots somewhere on a backup drive that they look at and just go, what was I doing? Like, no, this is awful, this is so terrible. And that and you'll realise, no, the reason why they are taking good photos now is because they learned how to take good photos. It's not just that they've got the best camera and that they've got great presets that they can apply to their shots. It's that they know how to take good photos. Um, I didn't really intend this section to be um, a lecture, but there we go. You've got one anyway. Um, so that does bring me to the end of this section. We're going to move on and we're going to answer some of your questions about my photography. I'm drinking Bonacord cream soda, by the way, and it is absolutely delicious. Uh, I keep having to buy it in uh, in reasonable bulk because um, I can't go out and buy some from any shops in Edinburgh. Mm. It's delicious. It is my favourite. 
Okay, so I asked for your questions on YouTube and on Instagram and from Twitter, and I got a good range of questions. So we'll start off with Drew Drew. Um, it says, did you study photography in college or uni, or are you self-taught? Also, did you choose this job for some personal reason, or just stumbled into it and went with it? So I'll start with the first one, and no, I am self-taught in my photography. Uh, I've never gone to um, university to, to, to study anything about uh, photography or filmmaking or anything like that. Um, and honestly, I don't think that's been a particular disadvantage to me, um, because I've been so keen to learn on my own, which, I, I, again, we've talked about the benefits of learning. Um, I... I don't, ha having not gone there, I don't have the frame of reference of, of going. I, I do, however, have no various people who have done photography or are fine arts and things at university. And I know that there's a lot of theory and um, thing which, which can really can really help you. So I think it would depend on the sort of course you were doing. Um, but for me, I've always preferred the idea of getting out there, getting out there with your stuff and, and learning from other from other photographers and the resources you can find online. So no, self-taught. Uh, did you choose this job for some personal reason or stumble into it and went with it? A um, little bit of both, actually. So I, as I've shown, I, I started doing photography from like an artistic, personal perspective when I was um, like 12 or 13 and even before then. I think we've always had cameras around the house and when we'd gone holiday when I was like six, we'd have those, um, the instant disposable ones. But I wasn't really taking photos artistically then. I was just taking snaps of my family on holiday. My my job, my the job that I got into, that I'm still doing now, is uh, as a journalist at CNET. And I started at CNET over 10 years, no, 10 years ago now. And... Um, but I wasn't taking photos. At the time, we had a uh, photographer who was doing product shots of just like a product on a white background. Uh, eventually, I started doing more because I loved it because I because I, I was a photographer on my own time. I started trying to do a lot more. And obviously, with journalism, you need photos to go with your story. So if I went to an event, if I went to something, I would take my own photos. Um, you know, I, I did things when I was behind the scenes inside McLaren's facility or if I would go to a place. So I just started doing more and more photography. I then started doing more product photography because we stopped doing the product on white thing and started trying to show them in, in like a real environment to show that you are, that we have actually held and used this product. If we're reviewing the iPhone, you don't want to see a product shot of it on white. You want to see it in your hands. You want to see it in use. So we started doing a lot more of that. I started getting more involved, and as a result, um, my 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 job now is probably half and half journalist and photographer, depending on what I'm doing. I also write a lot about photography, so um, it, it's not something I've stumbled into. It's very much been an intentional process, but it has been a gradual process. It's not. I did not get into photography. It's something that has just sort of become part of what I do. I uh, hope that's um, helpful. Neil Jones says, Hi Andrew, how did you start out charging for your photography and who are your customers? Well, as in the previous question, I, I am not charging for my photography. I don't really have customers. The photography I do professionally, I shoot for CNET um, and CBS. Um, so I am mostly, I suppose, a press photographer. Um, uh, I every so often do uh, weddings, um, uh, which... Uh, um is has its, uh, entirely has its own pricing structure so um pricing is something which is very very difficult to to kind of get a handle on when you are starting to do freelance and i have been contacted by various uh companies and publications and and things over the years from some of my other work um asking if they can license it and licensing is very very tricky because how do you put a price on it and it, it is it is difficult and honestly that is not just a video I could do separately. It's a whole series that I couldn't do, but other photographers could, and they do. So if you are, if that is something that's of interest, Neil, uh, and you are trying to figure out pricing yourself, um, I am not the resource to go to for this. Um, there are many. I know that F Stoppers have an entire course, a uh, paid for tutorial that's all about like the business of photography. I don't have that, but I, I'm led to believe that it's very good for that sort of thing. So maybe. Um, Maybe consider 
uh, going and taking a look at that yourself. But uh, no, I do not have customers. I have my job, CBS. Uh, Romina Lazarov, regular to the channel. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for all of your uh, contributions over the, the past months. Um, so did you like taking photos as a kid or was it something you picked up years later? Well, as I've shown, it is something that I have been doing certainly since I was uh, 12, so last 20 years. Um, what kind of photos did you like to take when you started and what kind of photos do you like to take now? Well, as we've just seen, there hasn't really been loads of, of difference. The things that I've always come back to time and time again is nature and landscape because that is just the thing that matters to me most personally i love being outdoors i love seeing beautiful places um i grew up in rotherham which is not the most beautiful of places but i moved to buxton when i was 10 and in the peak district it's a beautiful landscape i now live in scotland and the reason I I've, I've come to scotland is to be part of the landscape that scotland has and the islands that it has obviously lockdown kicked in almost as soon as i arrived so i've not explored much other than when i've come to scotland in previous years so yeah, I, it's still, the things that I love to do now is still my landscapes. Professionally, I do um, obviously editorial stuff and product stuff, and I love doing that. I love getting creative product photography in the studio. But being out in the landscapes, being, just taking that moment to just be outside somewhere, just, I'm sure everyone now understands what I, what I mean when we're all trapped inside. You want to get out and you want to get hiking and see the rolling hills and the forests and the mountains and the, the coasts. That's still what I, what I really love. What was your first camera? As uh, Romina asks again, um, as I think I, I may have mentioned, it was the Fujifilm Finepix A202 Compact 2 megapixels. Um, and uh, she says, what about, what about photography was the hardest for you to learn? Um, I'd say, I think it's probably, it's probably been composition. That's been the thing that, it's a thing that I've, I've, I know that I've mostly been lacking from my photos. I remember when I got my first Canon DSLR, the 350D, uh, the first thing I did was set it to manual mode and go out and take shots again and again. So I learned as much as I could about what exposure is, what shutter speed does, what aperture does, what ISO speeds do, and how all those things interact together to help you take your photo. So I kind of think that on a technical level, which has always been the thing that I, I'm quite technical, I'm a tech nerd, that's what I do. Um, so I feel that like I was, I had the technical side down to an ex, to a small extent fairly early on, but it was, again, it was the artistic vision and the composition that I didn't have. So that was a thing that's really taken the time. And it's only been in the last five or six years, I suppose, um, when I look at my shots that I think, okay, yeah, I've started to make better progress. And, and I do mean started to make progress. I have not got to a, a point where I'm I mean, I, I think with photography, you are always learning, but I don't think I've get, got to a really good point. I've still got so much to learn. And when I see other great photographers who are out there um, and I look at what they do and the way that they see some scenes, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's really good. I probably wouldn't have thought of that. So still loads to learn. Uh, so under average, under average doctor says best tip for someone trying to get better photos. Well, again, it's learning. Go out, learn everything you can, watch more YouTube videos, find more tutorials. The more you learn about how to take a good photo, the better your photos will be. And that is as simple as that. There is no one magic tip that if you use these settings, you're gonna get great photos. That doesn't exist. It's not about better cameras. It's not about better lenses. It's about knowing how to get the best from what you've already got. Chris England says, throughout the course of your career, how many dick pics have you taken? More than I can count, Chris. Uh, Pedro Hernandez says, do you still take macro pictures and which apps do you use? Uh, yes, Pedro, I do still take macro pictures. I've recently done a couple of macro videos. Um, Apps wise, uh, maybe you're talking, you've seen my macro things that I did from CNET. So apps for your on your phone, as I talked about in the CNET article, um, I mostly use uh, the Moment app because you can shoot in RAW and you get manual controls over everything. And also Moment do lenses uh, for your phone, which let you get macro shots. Um, 
An unfamiliar sky asks, what is your number one cat photography tip? Well, my number one cat photography tip would be to get the most beautiful cat in the world, which luckily I have got. His name is Toulouse, and he's just the best. Dan Smith says, hey Dan, Dan's from Edinburgh, he's a good guy. If you could only have one lens to shoot with, what would it be? Good question. Um, oh, you know, I'd love to be one of those cool photographers that says, oh, no, I would do everything with a 50 prime. You know, prime lenses are the best. I would just have that because the quality you get and stuff. I don't think that is what I would do. I would have to say it would be the Canon 24 to 105 because it's got the biggest range. It's wide angle at one end and it's a good amount of zoom at the other, 105 mil. It's not quite telephoto, but it's getting there. That is the do-it-all workhorse lens, I think, even more so than uh, the 24 105. So yeah, 24 to 105 f4 lens, which I do have, and that is the one I would choose if I had to grab one lens to go away with, and that was it. Uh, Ev Evgeny says, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Michael Howe says, which part of the photography process do you actually enjoy the most? Um, it's got to be getting out. It's being out in the field, almost literally in fields, uh, doing landscape stuff. As I say, landscapes is the thing that I'm drawn to the most. And it's partly because I love getting those photos, but it's also just the joy of being out, finding a great place and doing the research on, on a great area and then exploring it, walking, breathing in that air, seeing those sights. That is the reason why I still love photography as much as, as, as much as I do. I do love the editing. I do love sitting here and processing images for hours on end and seeing the results as they come out. But getting out in the field, doing that stuff is still the thing that I love the most. Uh, Mark asks, how do I photograph my member to ensure maximum perceived length? Well, Mark, that is a very, very good question. Uh, and as with anything like that, if you want to uh, emphasize a particular um, element, it's all about using good angles. Uh, shoot low, get a good angle, that is going to use that. Use a nice wide angle lens too. But um, from what I know of Mark, uh, I think he has practiced that more than enough. Uh, Damien Swanson asks, do you like incredible photos? Yes, Damien, I love them. And if I ever get to take one, then I will be very, very happy. But at the moment, I'm mostly looking at other people's incredible photos. Luke Westaway, friend of the show, asks, have you ever done any gig photography? What kind of setup would you bring? Um, I've done a couple of, of, of bits. Um, I did one for a CNET article about shooting a Don Broco gig using just the iPhone X. Um, so for that, my setup was just an iPhone 10, and I was really pleased with what I could get. But it largely depends on kind of where you are. If you're going to just be in the middle of a crowd, then taking a big DSLR, particularly with the flashes, isn't going to isn't really going to be that easy. So maybe a smaller mirrorless, maybe with like a, a 50 mil prime, something that you can get zoomed in a little bit on the stage but it's it's fast aperture so you're letting in a lot of light most gigs tend to be pretty dark um anas anas sammy says teach me something about mobile photography well anas uh, i can go a step further and i can point you towards a full suite of guides i've done for cnet uh, photog phone photography 101 we called it so I will leave a link to uh, that cluster of articles I've done in the link uh, under this video for you to check out but I've got everything from general tips to taking great photos of your phone through to specific landscape tips how to take great photos of cars there's all kinds of stuff in there so if you want to take better phone photos CNET is the place to go uh, Sarah Boyer asks what was your favorite location to shoot um, I would say that's probably got to be Iceland, um, which is probably a, a, a pretty common answer for a lot of photographers, certainly anyone who's into landscapes. Iceland is just an, the most incredible landscape. And uh, I drove around the whole ring road and it was just every single turn you make, there's another incredible view, there's amazing coast, there's mountains, there's just the most diverse landscape I think I've ever seen in one place. It was just an endless source of photography opportunities, and I loved it. I would love to go back at some point soon. Um, 
But that actually is one of the reasons I moved to Scotland, because Scotland also has an amazingly diverse uh, amount of landscapes to choose from. You've got the big open moorlands, you've got mountains. I mean, have a look at pictures of sky, and you've got these amazing rock formations going on. It's beautiful coasts, there's amazing lakes, there's all kinds of things. So cannot wait to explore more of Scotland. Uh, Gary Freeman asks, what is your take on mirrorless cameras, and will you ever switch to using one? Um... My take is that I think they're great. Um, I, I've i got a Fujifilm X-T20, uh, which uh, CNET bought for us just to be able to take on, if we don't want to have to pack a whole kit bag full of gear, if it's going on a small shoot somewhere, then I take this one, I can just keep it in a pocket. Certainly if it's a story that I'm writing myself and I'm trying to report and I'm trying to interview people, I don't want to have all my gear, so I just take this and I shoot away, and it's pretty good. Um, and that is the benefit of mirrorless, is that they tend to be a bit smaller, um, but certainly I found with some of the Sonys, the, the trade-off is that A, the battery life usually sucks, I think anyone who's a, a regular Sony shooter will agree, um, but also the native lenses are a lot bigger, because what you're not putting in the body, you end up having to put inside the lens, so Sony's G Master lenses are massive. So I don't really think there's a big trade-off in um, in like weight there. Um, Will I ever switch to using one? Um, it depends what Canon brings out. Uh, I certainly have no intention of switching from Canon to Sony. I'd have to overhaul all of my gear, and I have no intention of doing that. Um, Canon's uh, mirrorless so far, whatever they're called, I can't remember, um, I am not too fussed by. It's They look decent, but I've got a Canon 5D4. I've got two Canon 5D4s somewhere. Don't know where they are. Um, and they are more than good enough for what I'm currently using. The thing that will tempt me is, depending on what their uh, sort of teased EOS R, I want to say R5, the the one they've been sort of leaking some specs of, and they talk about 8K video. There's a lot of video discussion going on, but I haven't seen a lot of discussion around the photography um, elements, so I'm looking forward to seeing exactly what that is going to offer for a photographer first. And maybe that is something that I'll upgrade to, but then it doesn't have the same lens mount as my as my 5D4, so I'll have to change lenses and or get adapters, which adapters don't always work super well. They can slow down the autofocus. So I don't necessarily know if I will ever fully switch to a mirrorless. It really depends on what comes out. I hope that answers your question. Um, in fact, and I hope that answers everyone's questions. That does bring me to the end. Wow, I think this is going to be a long video with both those parts. Maybe I should have done them separately. Ah, who cares? Not got anywhere else to be. Why not make one very long video? Um, thank you so much. That is the thing that I want to reiterate at the moment because the only reason I'm doing this Q&A and stuff is to celebrate the fact that I've had so many amazing people coming along and getting involved with my channel so far. I didn't think I would hit a thousand subscribers, maybe even at all, certainly not as early as I have done and it seems to be growing and growing and people are being super kind, super nice. So thank you again to everyone who's been involved. Thank you to the truly dedicated people, which is you if you are still watching at this point because my God, you've got through all of this. Well done. Um, yeah, so thanks again. We, I, I'm hoping to have some amazing stuff coming up. I'm thinking a lot about what I want to do with the channel, but I am also very happy to hear your feedback. If there's something in particular that you want to see me do, if there are things that you like more than other things, do please let me know. I will take that into account. I'd love to know what people are after. Um, but that does bring me to the end. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.